Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen uh, to this uh, message from God's Word today. It's interesting that I, I'm actually doing the video on Friday, the 23rd. Tomorrow is our Christmas Eve candlelight service here at the church. And then, of course, on Sunday, we'll be here to worship the Lord as well on that day. And by the time you might get this, we'll, we'll be in the day after one or two of Christmas, just a few maybe days before New Year's. And on that note, I also want to take this time to wish you and each and every one of you a happy New Year and a blessed New Year as well. So it, it's, it's been something of a, a Christmas this year compared to the last few years. But yet it's all been said, it's all been done. All the weeks of preparation, the shopping, the Christmas baking, the Christmas cards mailed and received, the presents all wrapped up. Hampters delivered, five bucks goes into the Salvation Army bucket or whatever you put in there. Winter coats for the homeless, staff parties, traveling to visit family and friends, and in Canada these days, getting stuck in some winter storm somewhere else. Of course, one cannot forget the turkey or the ham and the mashed potatoes and the stuffing, and the cranberry sauce, all the works, the desserts. Christmas Eve candlelight service, check. Stocking and Christmas presents, check. Eggnog, new toys, more baking, check. It's all been said and done. The torn wrapping paper, the Boxing Day sales, returning gifts, check. Back to work with the dreaded visa bill looming over our head. Time for the lights and the trees to come down. And the only thing that is not coming down is the 10 extra pounds around our waists. It's all been said and done. It's all been said and done, for God kept his promise and sent his son, Jesus Christ. God incarnate, identifying with his people, came to set the captives free. To, he came in grace and truth. He came to die on the cross for the sin of the world, for your sin, my sin. And tomorrow is a new day, and it's all been said and done. The question is, friends, where do we go from here? Charles Dickens once wrote, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all year. How will you and I honor Christmas in our hearts every day? Or how about in 2023? And how are you going to respond to the message of Christmas 2022? And please turn in your Bibles to Luke. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. We're going to pick up the story after the birth of Jesus in verse 21. And we're only going to read a few verses today. So picking up the story in verse 21 of Luke chapter 2. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their perfect, their perfect purification, pardon me, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young, pinge, two young pigeons. The Lord bless the reading of his word. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, as, as Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, reminds us even now uh, that you kept your promise that the Messiah would come. And many in the days of Jesus, and many even might consider today that it, Jesus would come in a common village, in a small town. Yes, that's how you sent your Son. And we thank you, Lord, for all that that means to us and to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we dig a little deeper into the text, we remember the, the basic fundamental rules of exegesis or studying the Bible. Uh, one rule, one, three rules, context, context, context. And today we really do need to have a bit of Matthew's gospel along with Luke's gospel to give us 
the background to how Joseph and Mary and Jesus arrived here in Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And it's from that context that we can say uh, that we have discovered that Joseph and Mary were devout and faithful Jewish believers. Both the Gospels portray Joseph and Mary as righteous before God, and not only righteous, but called by God. We see not a lot about Joseph, but we can uh, determine from the Gospels that Ma John was a, a man of mercy and compassion. We see this in his response to the news that his betrothed was with child, not his child. We see this with Mary as a young woman of faith, revealing her faith in God as she submitted herself to the purposes of God for her life in a difficult situation. And we know through the Gospels as well, Matthew and, and Luke, that Joseph and Mary's faith in God were tested through very difficult and trying times. They were faced with many, for example, who wanted to kill their son, and the very ones that should have supported this family and provided the spiritual nourishment and guidance, the religious teachers and, and leaders of the day, while well, they reveal their uncaring and really their evil hearts towards this family. And Joseph and Mary, along with the baby Jesus, are for you and me a great example, a wonderful example of a family who placed their trust and dependence on the unchanging God that they served and not in the fickle and pickle nature of people. And truly, if there was ever a family that honored Christmas in their lives, it was this family of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Let's turn to Matthew. I would recommend if you have your Bible, you flip to Matthew chapter 1 for a moment. Keep your finger in Luke chapter 2. or keep a spot there, ready to flip back there eventually. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 to 25, gives us the commentary concerning Joseph when he found out that Mary was with a child. And the angel of the Lord said to Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you, sh and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Please notice in verse 20 here of Matthew chapter 1, the phrase, for that which is conceived. And the question is this, what, what has this to do with Jesus' birth, this, these verses? Well, pretty much all, everything. We see that Jesus was born of a woman, but not of a man. And that this phrase points to who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. You see, friends, Jesus was long, long before the manger and long before Christmas 2022. So it's interesting to note in the first century or in this context, and it's important in this context, is the giving of names in the days of Jesus. The name that Joseph was commanded to give the baby in the manger was from God himself. And the name given to Jesus reveals his nature, the Son of God, and that this Son of God is Savior, Lord, and Christ. Please notice the phrase in verse 21, for he will save his people from their sins. Friends, Jesus is the promised Savior and Lord. As the text tells us, he came to save. This is what Savior means. Jesus came to rule. This is what Lord means. My friends, it's not a democracy. Of course, people are free to call Jesus by faith their Savior and Lord, or not. Yet we need to keep in mind that one day in God's time, all people will bow their knees to Jesus, the righteous or the unrighteous, as the scripture says tells us in Revelation 17, 14, because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Let's look at this from another angle. Can I ask you this question? What was Jesus' last name? Now, if the name Christ came to mind, I don't want to burst your bubble, but that was not Jesus' last name. For Christ or Christos means anointed. The sense here is this is one who is anointed of the Lord. Friends, Jesus is God's anointed. The babe born in the manger, 
That first Christmas was the Christ that was to come as promised by God and proclaimed by the prophets of God. Let's flip back to Luke's gospel. And here, in our context here, in Luke, Luke chapters two, con, chapter, chapter 2, the context there, pardon me, we find Joseph and Mary in obedience to the law of Moses. And they had Jesus circumcised on the eighth day. And only then was Jesus given his name as commanded by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 21. Let's turn now to verse 22 and 23. And let's read that together. Verse 22 and 23. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 22 and 23. Well, we need to do a little bit of work here, a little bit of, uh, little bit of research, if you will. We need to turn to Leviticus chapter 12, and you should do so if you want. You have time now to turn to Leviticus chapter 12, verse 2 to 8, for commentary concerning our passage here in Luke. We see there God through Moses commanding his people Israel concerning the birth of male children. And on the eighth day, the male child would be circumcised according to God's command. And then after 33 days, the mother would be permitted to make the required sacrifice. And this 33 day of waiting was required not only for a male child, but also a female child. Only the female child, of course, would not be circumcised. But let's stop here. Let's just press pause for a moment because I don't want anyone to get all tied up in knots because of, our, because of our 21st century biases, our assumptions. You know, the easy way out for this preacher would, to, would, would be to say, because of Jesus, we're no longer required to bring a sacrifice when a child is born. And that being true, I have never been accused of doing anything the easy way. And because we must approach our text biblically or with, you know, with, biblically, with our minds thinking biblically, let me remind you that the law and the commandments as described in the Old Testament are a revelation of many things, but certainly of God's nature. And it's from the law and the commandments that we cannot miss, and we must not miss, that God is holy and perfect. And by the way, we are not. Perfect. When we read that a woman was to wait 33 days after a male child was circumcised before she could bring her sacrifice to God, it was because, as one commentary put it so well, quote, the days of her perf purification were necessary as a reminder we were all born in sin. We think of the prophet Nathan. Nathan who charged David with adultery with Bathsheba. And then, saw, and then later on, in response to this, David, King David uh, pens Psalm 51. And in verse 5 of that psalm, David said this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Boy, is that ever contrary to the culture's narrative. Anyways, the point is this. Mary was faithful to God. She believed the Bible and knew that God was holy and perfect. Mary knew this. She recognized her dependence on God for everything, and that included forgiveness. When we consider our relationship with God, Mary's example should remind us that we, too, need God's forgiveness. We have all, as Paul said, fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned, yet God has given the one and only purifier that is Jesus Christ and because of his shed blood on the cross we can be cleansed from our sins and counted righteous before a holy just and perfect God well let's go to verse 23 please notice that after a time of purification Jesus was presented to the Lord according to the law of the Lord Joseph and Mary present Jesus to the Lord in the temple. Secondly, Joseph and Mary do this in accordance to the Word of God, to the Holy Bible. Or as Luke writes it here in, our, in this text, the law of the Lord. 
And what we see here is Joseph and Mary's commitment to the Word of God. We see their obedience to the commands of God as written in Scripture. We need to reach back to the time of Exodus when God said to Moses in Exodus 13, 1, Concentrate, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. This dedication was a reminder of God's gracious deliverance of the firstborn of Israel from the angel of death in Egypt prior to their deliverance from Egypt. And Joseph and Mary committed their child to Jesus over to God's keeping. They did that. And they did this in the context of the covenant family of God, where both the parents and the community were charged by God to raise the child in the name of the Lord. Well, folks, we've arrived at our last verse, Luke 2, 24. And this verse speaks so much so loudly about the forgiveness of sins. We've had a brief but a, an opportunity nonetheless to see the commitment that Joseph and Mary had to God. We can say without a doubt that Joseph and Mary were indeed godly parents. They were faithful and righteous followers of God. They were obedient to his commandments. And here we see them bringing their offering before the Lord. Again, we will need to appeal to the 12th chapter of Leviticus. For Joseph and Mary spent a total of 41 days preparing to present Jesus in the temple and bring their offering. Leviticus 12, verse 6, and 8, to 6 to 8, we read, And when the days of her purifying, speaking of the mother, are completed, she shall bring a lamb a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. If she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. Have you ever heard someone say this idiom? Don't get caught up in the trees or you'll miss the forest or something like that. Well, let's not do that here with Leviticus chapter 12. You see, there's a bigger picture in view here. There's a bigger picture in view here. For the requirements of the law in the Old Testament are but a shadow and a type of what the baby Jesus would fulfill and complete once for all in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Well, let me put it this way. People like Mary and Joseph in the days of the Old Testament believed in God in the same way followers of Christ do today by faith. The requirements of the law, the commandments of the law, the sacrifices required under the law were offered up by faith. And by faith, these were received by God. Of course, the ceremonial and the civil law is no longer in effect. But what has remained is what Paul says, said to the Ephesian church in his letter to them, by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2.8 By faith, Joseph and Mary raised their son in the days and years after that first Christmas. The question that was asked of us when we began is here before us now. How will you and I honor Christmas all our days? And our example, which has been exemplary, has been great, I should say, today has been Joseph and Mary. So I would suggest maybe, I would suggest three ways we can do this as we now move into 2023 and into our lives. First, repent. First, repent. The Apostle John said in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 9, In this the love of God is made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. Joseph and Mary lived their lives faithfully before God. They knew that their sin, if not dealt, with, not dealt with, would come between them and their relationship with God. Friends, this is one of the characteristics of sin. It separates us from a relationship with God. And Joseph and Mary sought the forgiveness of God. 
In order to please God, the writer of Hebrews said that we must believe God. And friends, that biblical faith always seeks repentance. And my friends, repentance is more than saying a prayer in our hearts or slipping our hands up in an evangel- evangelical meeting. It's more than that. Repentance is first and foremost recognizing that God is holy and we have sinned against a holy and just God. We are rebels in rebellion against God. Repentance is turning away from following the gods of pride and selfishness, the gods of our making, the gods of our culture around us. It is a turning toward God and seeking his forgiveness. So one, repent. Two, receive. Joseph and Mary, by faith, received God's gift, Jesus Christ. They received what Jesus would grow up to say one day in a synagogue as he quoted from the prophet Isaiah, where Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set a liberty to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. One, repent. Two, receive. And three, rejoice. Rejoice. Friends, Joseph and Mary rejoiced with the people of God. They celebrated the goodness and the mercy and grace of God that first Christmas. They offered up their child to God's purposes and his will. You know what the reality is? The reality is, I believe this so so much that Joseph and Mary lived out in their lives John 3.16. John said, God so loved the world that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So the question is how can you and I honor Christmas? in our hearts, throughout our lives, and throughout the year. Repent, receive, and rejoice. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy each and every day. We live in difficult times. This is nothing new in the history of the world, but we didn't live in the past, we live now. And it's difficult for many. As I think about all that's going on in the world around us, there's so much darkness. But as we think about that Christmas so long ago, the people were waiting for hundreds of years for the Savior. And Lord, you sent your Son. And the light of the world came into the world, even though the world did not recognize him, the Scripture tells us. And we thank you for your mercy and kindness that we find in Christ. May we live every day of our lives honoring Christmas as Joseph and Mary did. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, one more time. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Shalom.